Hi, my name is Joe King and I'm one of the co-founders of Revival Brothers. If you're a real estate investor and looking to dissect, analyze, or purchase residential assets, you've come to the right place. Our goal is to provide you with tips, tricks, and resources needed to elevate your game as an investor in the residential real estate market. We look at everything from mortgage notes to rentals to rehabs and break it down for you. Please make sure you subscribe so that we can notify you as new content is posted. This week's Trade Desk webinar is on how to place an indicative bid for NPLs, that's non-performing loans, on a tape that has no addresses. The assets on this tape ended up selling for a crazy amount. They went for par, and yes, that means 100% of the unpaid principal balance, and this is for non-performing notes. That's nuts, right? In this video, we're going to learn how to place bids on a set of indicators that we calculate off the seller provided data. We will learn how to navigate the tape, how to use the analytic tools, what to look for, and what to avoid. So let's jump into it. This is RB103. For those of you who didn't look at it or, or didn't make any bids, I'm just going to go through it and show you a little bit about what this tape is about. On our instruction sheet, you'll always find most of the information related to the tape kind of summarized here. So when you come to this instruction sheet, you'll see tape details. These tape details are exactly the same as what we email out. So when you receive an email from us, you'll see this information, including all of the states that are on the tape, as, uh, as you can see here. So what, what do we know about this tape? It's first position. They're all mortgages. We're not looking at CFDs. We're not looking at lease options or anything like that. These are just straight up mortgages. We have six sub-performing loans and we have 126 non-performing loans. Uh, as far as the loan status goes. There's 132 total loans on this tape. The average unpaid principal balance on the tape is um, 679,000, a total of 88 million in uh, unpaid principal balance on the tape. So when this is important to us because when we look at it, we already know if, if there's an average of 679, that's basically uh, where we're gonna be uh, maybe minus 20 to 50%, depending on the asset uh, on, our, on our bid, meaning that, you know, as an investor, if you're going for low end assets, this might not be the tape for you. If you're going for higher end assets, this definitely would be the tape for you. Our weighted average uh, cumulative LTV is 65.51%. Um, and one of the things that we've added is, are these little triangles here. So if you guys uh, ever want to know what these acronyms mean, just mouse over these, these areas and it'll tell you weighted average, current loan to value. Um, and then also we've added a new feature on the yield section that I'm going to show you in a minute too, that kind of explains industry standards of where you want those in um, for your investments. You know, what percentage do you want your ceiling to be at for um for your LTV versus, you know, um, versus maybe something like your FICA or uh, debt to income ratio. As we go down the list, uh, we can see our GWAC. Our GWAC is, is nothing more than our interest rate. And this is an average interest rate. Again, if you just mouse over it, it'll explain it. FICA scores, everyone knows what that is. It's related to credit. You want those, those credit numbers to be in a certain range if you're in, investing now. Everybody has different exit strategies. Some people go for lower, higher FICA scores. Some people have different requirements when it comes to L LTV and rates. Um, but at the end of the day, as we go through this, I'm gonna show you how you can kind of uh, narrow down your selections with the tools that we've provided here. We also have uh, Loan average, uh, so, so this loan age right here is an average loan age, which basically tells us that these are brand new loans that are maximum maybe two years old. Keep in mind that these are higher end assets. Uh, and if you look at the states that they're in, a lot of these are in higher end neighborhoods and the assets are worth a lot more. And we'll get into that in a second too. The debt to income ratio was not supplied by the seller in this case, so we don't have it listed. But if we do have that information, it will go in here and we will calculate an average for you. Our remaining term is in here as well. Again, you know, out of a 360 term, the average is uh, 359. So 
that again tells us that these are brand new loans and um, brand new loans are good because uh, it sets you up for a good to, to be in a good position to sell a partial, especially when you're front loaded with interest on these loans. One of the tools that we're going to be developing here in the future is to understand what those partials mean and how to sell them and how to maybe capitalize on them, even if the interest rates on the loans are in, are in the range of four to eight percent. There there are ways that you can. Uh, sell those partials, recapitalize your money, and keep the back end of these loans while going after more loans. Moving down the list, we have uh, delinquent payments. We, we, we actually calculate these delinquent payments. This isn't something that's uh, provided by the seller. We calculate it for you so you can understand um, what that, that position is uh, just at a glance. And then we also let you guys know if whether or not the seller is willing to let you buy or cherry pick off of the these assets. Keep in mind, if you if you buy one asset and there's another bidder on the asset that you're interested in, even though your bid might be higher, the, if the other bidder comes in and buys a pool of assets, sometimes the sellers will give it to those bidders because they're interested in selling more in bulk. So if you guys are interested in purchasing in bulk, you can probably get better deals, bottom line. Some of the other uh, information that's provided by the sellers is the delinquent terms. So how far out they're, they're delinquent. This kind of breaks it down into different categories like 30 to 59, 60 to 89, 90 to 119. And it tells you what the interest balance is for all of these delinquent terms, you know, or 120 plus. So it gives you a general idea it, uh, of what's on the tape in case you were looking at maybe purchasing in bulk or you just wanted to look at it from a glance and determine whether or not you wanted to even look at the tape. A couple of the other things on this instruction sheet are pricing guidelines. These pricing guidelines are pretty much the same for notes from seller to seller. There's always going to be a due diligence period. There's always going to be an indicative bid. The process is this. You find an asset that you're interested in. You make your indicative bid. The, the seller says your the bid is, is accepted. Once they said it's accepted, you're locked in. You start your due diligence. You have up to seven days to do that due diligence. And, you know, whatever exceptions that you find, you're asking the seller to cure. If the seller can't cure it, you're adjusting your bid accordingly. That's typically how it works. Once that seven day period has passed, if you haven't gotten back to anybody, the seller will assume that everything's okay and they're going to want to move forward with funding. So that's the next phase is funding. Once everything's funded, the seller will release the collateral files, the original collateral files, not the electronic collateral files and get them mailed to you. And then you'll switch your servicer and we'll get title transferred and all that fun stuff. So that's typically how it works in a, in a nutshell. There's a little bit more to it, but it's not much, and it, it's fairly uh, straightforward and a simple process. There's always included in these instructions for the notes, and it kind of goes a little bit through that, that process. In some cases, um, if you're new to us and you haven't uh, worked with us before, we'll ask for a proof of funds. And uh, this just lets us know, it lets the, our, our sellers know that um, you're a serious buyer and that you have cash on hands to purchase the assets. There are people out there that are working with other investors or other people's money on purchasing deals. And in those cases, we just need to make sure that we're going we're, we're gonna to be in a position where we can fund at the end of the day. Because the last thing we want is to go down this whole road, get accepted on a bid, get to the funding part and everything to fall out if that happens. It doesn't look good for us. It doesn't look good for you guys. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you get blacklisted. People don't want to do business with you because you can't close. So that's, that's super important to us. Now, one of the other things on this uh, instruction sheet is our, our trade desk fee. How do we get paid? Well, sometimes we get paid by the seller. Sometimes we get paid by the buyer. It really depends on on who the seller is and, and what their preference is. Regardless of whether it's from the seller or the buyer, the net outcome is typically the same. And so in this case, you can see that the from seller column is highlighted. And because of that, 
we know that our fee is going to come from the seller and it's 0% to the buyer. So whatever indicative bid you get, that is it. There's no hidden fees. There's nothing else on top of that. that it is what it is. If this column was highlighted, it would be the opposite. And we would actually on the tape indicate how much uh, our fee is per asset and it auto calculates for you. And I'll show you that in a second. Up here, we've created a tool for you guys. And this tool is to set your strike price. So if you are interested in setting a strike price at a certain percentage of the unpaid principal balance, you can do that here and it will reflect on the tape. It'll also auto calculate a bunch of stuff for you that I'll get into in a second. But for now, it's set at zero. If I go to the tape and I go over to the strike price column, which is this green column over here. Can you, can you see my screen, uh, Rick? Yep. Okay. This column over here, you can see everything's zeroed out and it's zeroed out because I have it zeroed out on the instruction sheet. So that again, everything in green is calculated by us and then everything in white is supplied by the seller. So if I come back to the instruction sheet and said, you know what, I'm gonna start my bidding here for these non-performing notes at 70 cents on the dollar because these are higher end bids. Subperforming notes, I'm gonna start at 65 cents on the dollar. Okay. I'm going to come back to the to the tape and it's auto auto calculating it for me at those those percentage rates. Now, one thing I'll point out here is that if for whatever reason there was no equity in in the deal, meaning there was uh, it was upside down, it would indicate that for you here. Right. So uh, and I'll show you an example. I'll just take this top one here and I'll make it two hundred thousand. See what happened? It, it shows me that there's negative equity. And because there's negative equity, it changed the strike price. It changed the strike price to reflect the value. It's 140,000. It's a percentage of the value versus a percentage of the unpaid principal balance. Okay. So it's smart that way. And it'll help you guys um, understand your position at a glance very quickly and help you to move through and um, identify some of the better deals or Maybe what your strategy is, is looking at those upside down assets and, and going after those, because I can tell you right now that not a lot of people like them, but there are strategies where you can make a lot of money on those because the sellers just want to get rid of them. And they know nobody wants to bid on them unless they're buying in bulk. And that's part of the deal. So, uh, but I'm going to leave this as, as it was. So now you guys know the strike price and how that works. Now, just because we have a strike price column, that doesn't mean that these are set in stone. This is just a suggestion based on a percentage that you've entered here, right? So I'm coming back to the tape. I'm, I'm seeing that there's equity on all of these deals, pretty much. There's one down here that doesn't have, have any, but most of these are all positive equity deals, right? But we can also see the seller provided um, values. Now these values are BPOs. And, and when I see values like this from uh, a seller, I wanna know when they took those. Some sellers will give us that date, some won't. And we can find out later once we receive the collateral files after we've made our indicative bids. But in this case, they gave us the date. So in this column where it says estimated value date, this is the date that these BPOs were taken. So when I look at this, I can see some of these are in 20, 2020, some are in 2021. So, you know, this gives you an idea of that valuation and whether or not that valuation may, be, may have changed based on the market and what's going on with the market today. Because we don't have the address on this tape, we have to go by this value that the seller is giving us. Once we get into that due diligence, if we find that that value is worth a lot less, we change our bid accordingly. And to me, it actually makes a lot more sense and it's a lot easier to make these indicative bids because it puts the buyer in more of a, a, a strong position to negotiate that bid, especially if uh, the valuations come in a lot lower and maybe there's back taxes or, or other things going on. But because these are fairly new loans, I highly doubt that there's any tax issues on them. Um, so I wouldn't be too worried about that at this point anyway. The other thing that is very important are understanding how many delinquent payments there are. 
how many payments have been made, how many payments are remaining. And we have this column in here, it's delinquencies past maturity. The only reason we have this in here, let's say that the mortgage went past 360 months. If it went past that period and there was still money owed, it would indicate that here. And the reason why that's important is because especially when you're dealing with balloons or interest only payments, you wanna know how far out they are past those, those maturity dates. The one question that you would wanna ask is what are the uh, late fees associated with that? That's gonna put you in, a, in another position to potentially foreclose on it in the future. You know, And if they're interest only loans, they're probably looking at short-term construction loans and, and stuff like that. Cause interest only loans aren't, aren't typically where you're dealing with borrowers that are in houses that require Dodd, a lot of Dodd-Frank policy. It's more, you know, people trying to quickly turn the property, meaning they're fix and flippers or, you know, maybe, maybe they are owners and they're trying to, to fix up the property. I don't know, but it's going to be a shorter term at the end of that. If it hasn't been paid off, there's going to be some action that needs to be taken. And that's what this is for. This reinstatement column is very important to me personally, because, because it tells me how much the borrower owes from the unpaid principal balance. Now this doesn't include fees and it doesn't include all of the arrearages. It just includes the unpaid principal. So this tells me that, that in order to reinstate this borrower, for example, it's going to cost them a minimum of $62,000 to get current with that loan, right? So uh, this, really, this really helps you understand as you go into potentially re reworking that loan, how easy or hard it's going to be based on what they owe and based on their delinquencies over here. So there are some that are 12 months out or some that three months out. And again, everybody has a different strategy. And um, if you're looking to uh, <coughs> potentially work out the deal with the borrower, I'd be looking at the shorter term stuff, the, the three to six months in the three to six month range, because typically there, there's going to be less of a reinstatement amount there. You're, you're probably going to recoup that amount if you can work it out with a, with a borrower, or you're going to do your own kind of loan modification on it. The ones that are further out are going to be a little bit more difficult because they're going to owe more money. So what becomes important to me is looking at this reinstatement amount versus the equity, right? Because if they're not in a position where they have more equity than they owe, then they're essentially in a, they're not in a very strong position to pay you back. So for instance, this, this reinstatement amount right here is six, $6,225. If I come over here to the equity, there's 83,000 in equity. So it's very likely that this borrower could afford to pay back um, this reinstatement amount plus whatever arrearages are associated with it because they have 83,000 in equity in it. When we look at these tapes and we look at assets, this is what we're thinking when we're making our initial decisions. All right, so moving on, we also have a lien status area. Now, this is, this is all calculated by us because we, what we found is that some sellers don't really know or understand what, where their tape is because they haven't calculated it themselves. So we've ran our own calculations to know what's uh, performing, non-performing, or sub-performing. And the way we define it is if, they're, if there's no delinquencies, obviously it's performing. If the delinquencies are anywhere from one to three months, we, we call that sub-performing. If it's three months or above, we're, we're putting it in a non-performing category. Coming back to indicative bid. Now we have a column here that, that it, it's highlighted in yellow. This is where you place your indicative bid. So for instance, if we were over here and we were looking at the, the strike price, which is basically calculated for you at the rate that you entered in the instruction sheet here, right? And you were happy with that number, you would literally either copy that number and paste it in or, or type it in the right column right here. Once you do that, you'll, you'll notice that there's a number that pops up on our trade desk fee. And this is what I was talking to you guys about earlier, is if this tape, um, if we were paid by the buyer in this case, this number right here 
would show a fee. But right now, because we're being paid through the seller, there is no fee. And so, you know, everything is 100% upfront transparent. So you know exactly what's going on at all times with these tapes. That's the whole point. The way that uh, our pricing breaks down, again, is described here in our trade desk fee. All the numbers are here and it kind of breaks it down for you. When that, that's all highlighted, you'll, you're able to see it a little bit better. So, but again, it's all 100% transparent. It's all automated for you. So you don't have to do anything. Now, we talked a little bit about organization. Right. And I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I'm kind of going through the process a little bit of how we might look at, at assets and, and how we might pull some out. So one of the things is being organized. And uh, we've created this tool here for everyone to, you know, pull down or drop down, whether it's to check the asset, whether it's a good asset, a bad asset or the best asset, you can actually tag it right here and it highlights the entire row for you. That helps you to keep keep organized. If you don't want one, all you got to do is delete it and it'll go away. So it's a super nice tool to have. And um, the reason why I'm showing you this now is because I'm going to get into the yields tool and, and show you what we've done there and, and how it actually will help you to either even further identify deals, okay? So with that, I'm going to jump to the yields tool. Now we have a yields button up here and we have a tab down here. Either way, we'll get you to the same page. So when you go to the yields tool, tool uh, what we have here now is a lot more information that than what we had before. This is the strike price. It's coming in from the strike price column at the same rate that we entered here, 70%, 65%. If I come back to the yields area, you'll see this column right here has the percentage of UPB, you can see that they're 70 and 65% all the way down, unless you see an upside down asset like this one here. The reason why I know it's upside down is because it's in the equity column and it has a negative number. It's at 45% of UPB. Why again, is it at 45? Because the offer or the strike price is coming off the value rather than the UPB. Because if you made your bid off the UPB, you're losing money and nobody wants to be in that position. A couple of the other features that we've added to this, you'll see some of the highlighted columns. Now, the reason they're highlighted has nothing to do with whether or not this is something that you're looking for. This is more for, for our purposes, but if you mouse over these, these red areas up here, it kind of explains what it is. Like in this case, everything that's at a rate of 8% or above is highlighted for me already. So I know that's isolated, right? And if I come over here to my FICA score, I, I want my FICA score to be um, in the range of 670 and above, right? And so everything that's 670 and above is gonna be highlighted in blue. So that, that again, dwindles it down and isolates your risk exposure. When we talk about risk mitigation, the, the things that you wanna have in line are your loan to value, your DTI and your FICOs. So if you're in specific ranges on those, then uh, you're, you're mitigating your risk accordingly. You're going to probably also pay a little bit more of those loans, but at the same time, they're going to be less risky. The LTV is the same thing. We, we have, if you mouse over, it tells us that with values of 80% or higher, we're going to highlight them in red to tell you that those loan to values are above that threshold, right? So for instance, this one's at 92%, it's in red. This one's at 81, this one's at 86. But the rest of them seem to be within that, that margin, right? So um, again, this is a tool to start to isolate and under, understand from a bulk standpoint, what's going on with these, these uh, assets. The debt to income ratio, we didn't get the information from the seller on this particular tape, but we, um, when we do get it, it will have that information and it'll have those thresholds in here as well. And we're looking at specific thresholds that are in line with certain underwriting uh, needs. So if you're looking to adhere to Dodd-Frank, for example, and Dodd-Frank guidelines, then um, this becomes very important to you as a buyer. And then of course, the position, the lean position, what it is, is it performing or non-performing? A lot of times we'll get tapes with subperforming, performing, and non-performing. And, and sometimes we'll even have REOs kind of sprinkled in there. So this, this just gives you that 
all-in-one uh, look at the loan, how it's performing and what it really looks like. Now, when we were going through this, we said, well, you know, this is fine and dandy, but you know, when you identify some of these deals, how do you tag them and go back to the main sheet? So what we did was we added this marker column over here. So if you're interested in anything, for example, the one that's highlighted right here, by the way, is carrying over from the tape. So if I go back to the tape itself, this is checked, right? And because it's checked, it's highlighting on the uh, yields tool, right? This row right here, it's exactly that. These are the rows. This is the row number nine. So when I come back to the tape, you can see that it's on nine right here. Hopefully you guys can see that. If I were to delete this, now nothing's highlighted and come back to the yield sheet, nothing's highlighted over here, okay? Now on the reverse, if I'm, if I'm looking at, you know, some of these assets, let, let's say for example, I wanted to isolate some of these and I wanted to just look at everything at 8% and above, I could do this. Um, I could actually go uh, filter everything that is greater than 8%, okay? All my, all my stuff is filtered now at everything above 8%. And now when I look at that, I can see, okay, there's one that's upside down. There's a couple that don't meet my loan to value needs, but there's, there's quite a bit that, that looks to be uh, really nice. So I can, I can further look at this from higher FICA scores. So if I wanted to just look at FICA scores that are 700 or, or, or 680 and above. So again, I can come in here and I can filter for everything greater than 680. Now I have a list that, that I can work with. I can see that there are two LTVs in here that I might not want to work with. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna put an X here and I'm gonna mark these columns. And as I do it, they're gonna highlight. I'm gonna leave these two open. And when I come back to my tape, the markers are highlighted. So from here, I could say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to check this. I'm going to, I'm going to check this. So all of these you can check. And if you like it, you know, you can change it from check to offer, right? And then you could put your offer in here. And then when you're done, you email it back to us just like this. And this helps us understand exactly where you are with, with, with that offer. It helps us also take the information uh, to the seller very quickly because we have a sheet that all this goes into. And if, and if all we have to do is cut and paste it from this sheet into another sheet, it makes it super easy for us. But when we get offers in that says, hey, you know, I want to make an offer on that New York asset on you know, RB103. Well, there's lots of New York assets. We don't know which one you're talking about. And um, even if you give us the RB number, we still have to go in and we have to search for it and, and identify it. So let's say that you had uh, a bunch of offers in here on, on these guys. And let's say that on a couple of these, you didn't want offers. If I come back to my, um, my uh, yield sheet, you know, I let's say I didn't want this one, I delete it. Um, I come back here. It's gone. I can isolate all of the offers simply by clicking on my filter button up here, unchecking everything but offer, okay? Clicking okay, and there's all my offers. So now I can see everything together. I can see all my offers. I can see how much um, I'm, I'm gonna pay to the seller for all of these offers and I can place my indicative bid and I know exactly what my position is going into it. If these offers are accepted, again, you start your due diligence and you move forward from there. That's, that's pretty much how, how simple the process is. Now, oh, it looks like there's a couple of questions, Rick. Actually, it was just the one and they, uh, Patrick came in late and was just asking, is this the property analyzer? Um, or does this have to do with what's included on them when the tapes go out? So I already, I already uh, addressed it. Okay. All right. So you, before we go any further, are there any questions? Feel free to raise your hand and ask and, 
you know, let's, let's, let's make this an open dialogue. And one of the things I'm trying to point out here is that you don't necessarily need to have an address to place an indicative bid when you kind of know the value of those notes and, and you have a, a particular exit strategy in mind. It uh, looks like David has a question. David, uh, I'm going to bring you on. Hey, David. Hey, Jill. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, just a, a quick question. Um, the the UPB that you have selected here it looks like about maybe $2 million uh -huh. in UPB, but the indicative bid is only 117000 Can you explain the difference there? Okay. Um, well, this indicative bid, basically, let me um, let me open this back up. I mean, bottom line, I was expecting it to be much higher than you, that. You see, you see this right here. That's what it's reading. There are no bids in here. So if I were to place, I'm just going to put one in here just to show you for illustrative purposes on this. So if I were to have a bid in all of these areas here. So typically, and, you would have had that that hundred and seventeen thousand dollar offer flagged as an as an offer in that left column. Right, what it was doing, yeah, it was adding this column up. But yep. we had we had that bid somewhere that that wasn't in an offer. We didn't we didn't have this tagged as an offer, right? Exactly. So yep. so when you have this tagged as an offer, we're going to go through and we're going to see you know, all of the offers versus whatever else you have in there. We're only going to take the offers. So mm -hmm. if you had another number in here, we would take it out. If that was your question. Yeah, it kind of was. So, so if I do one of these, I have to make sure I have an offer next to it. Otherwise my bid here is going to be inflated by however much, you know, was on that other sheet that was not flagged offer. No, that's not the case. So in your example, which were the screen we're looking at right here, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It said 117,000. Right. But but I in, I in fact, well you in fact had not placed a bid on any of the ones that you had offered. So I, if you put if you had put $10,000 on each one of the ones that you had offered, that right. would have totaled 50,000 here, but it would have also added the 117 that was on the other one. So you, your total bid here would have been $167,000 total to sell it. Correct. And it was because I did have an, I had a bid up here that was 117. Exactly. Right. That's, that's, that's where we need to be careful and make sure that we don't have something hanging out there like that, because otherwise we'll be overbidding. Well, what, it, yeah, exactly. So, and, th and that's why it adds it up for you. So you can actually see what's going on. Now, yep. th the other thing too, is if there is no offer over here, we're going to delete this. We're not going to send that to the seller. Well, what we'd probably do is actually call you up and, and make sure that, that, you know, it's not a mistake or it was meant to be. So that, that's what I would have done. So, yeah. okay. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah no we, we go through it pretty thorough. And then if we see something that's out of line, then what I'll do is I'll give you a call. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. No problem. Thanks for coming on. Coming back to this, this yields tool. Now, um, hopefully you guys can see how easy it is to kind of isolate uh, those, those, the information. Now, one of the things I'm gonna point out here, uh, especially people that understand Excel and how it works, because a lot of times when you wanna clear the, the sorting that it's doing here with, uh, with these dropdowns, a lot of times they'll come up here and, and you'll try to clear it here, but you can't because it's locked. And it's locked for a reason because what ends up happening if, if that's not locked and these things get reorganized and uh, for instance, like maybe you organize them based on, you know, state or, or whatever, you can't go back to the original uh, layout. You can't go back to the original order that it was in. So that's why we have it that way. So when you, when you are searching with these filters, you see this little arrow right here underneath. Let me see if I can zoom in. There's a little filter button here with it, with a, an arrow. That's an indicator that we have filtered that column based on this category. So if I wanted to just select everything, I could select everything and, and clear that. If I wanted to come over here on the rate, I can do the same thing. I can select everything and clear that. So it comes back to 
where it was before. Same thing with the FICA. Um, you can see that little arrow there. I can select everything and clear it back to its original state. So everything's in the right order. Everything is uh, represented from this sheet to the tape sheet perfectly. And that's the reason why we do that in case you guys were wondering. Another tool that we have here also for principal and interest loans is a, an amortization schedule that checks those loans for any kind of issues that might be with them, meaning like there's a loan modification on them or there's, there's some other thing happening with that loan that's not amming out correctly. So if I were to copy everything that's in this red from line to line and bring it over to my P&I tool select this uh, UPV cell right here, and everything's explained up here. If I right click here, and then I just paste my values in, it'll tell me if there's an issue with that loan. And in this case, there is telling me there's an issue, and that's why everything's going red. We don't know what that issue is yet. What we're gonna have to do is make sure that we understand why the information that the seller is giving us isn't amming out. But if I make my indicative bid based on the information that the seller's given me, um, I need to make sure that my bid is a little bit lower on this asset because there's, some, there's something going on with it that we don't know. Now, we've, we've tried to give as much information down here as possible, but in some cases, when they're not amming out, it's you're not gonna be able to figure out exactly um, what's going on. This tool really helps us look at the, the final date of a loan. Like for instance, this is 480 months. This is how it ends out versus what they said it was. In this case, I, I believe it was like 360 or something. Let me go back. Still oh, oh, no, they said it was 480. So um, now because that's 480 right there and not 360, your standard 360, that just tells us there's probably a loan modification on this somehow. And it might have to do with the UPB being 1.1 million. Now, if I come up here to this one and I copy this and, and paste it in, uh, you can see everything goes green. So this one AMS out the way that it should. There's 360 periods. I can look at my amortization schedule here and I can see that it goes to 360 and this is my maturity date right here, 4-1-2048, which should coincide with the maturity date that they give us uh, here. So, and it does. So it's just a way to put checks in there to check the numbers, to understand the p &I on the loan. Now, in some cases, there's gonna be taxes and insurance included as well. And if the seller uh, provides that information, the, it'll be here. In this case, it is provided. And, um, and there, there's a total balance. So, so the way that this works is you have an unpaid principal balance and you have a total balance. And the total balance is like the taxes and insurance added on top of the unpaid principal that, that has uh, interest on it. So this column is always going to be interest bearing. This is your interest bearing um, unpaid principal balance. And it's basically what you're buying. You're not buying a payment stream that doesn't have interest on it. So you're not, you don't care about the taxes and insurance. What's important for you to know is how much the borrower is actually paying. And that's why this information is in here. So um, when you do see that on a tape, it doesn't need to be our tape, any tape, make sure that you're calculating everything based on your interest bearing unpaid principal balance. Because if you're using the total balance, you're, you're actually paying more for that loan than you should. Because really what you're buying is the interest bearing unpaid principal balance, because you want that interest. And the other thing that this, uh, this p &I tool will do for you is it'll, it'll allow you to take a look at the interest um, on this loan versus how many payments have been made. So if I come back to the tape and I see that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and mark this one check so that I can see it all the way across. And I, if I come over here and I look at my delinquent payments and I look at my payments remaining and how many have been made, I'm at nine payments in. Okay, so if I come back to my, uh, 
my PI tool and I go down to nine payments, I can see that my interest on this is $3,645. And the principal that's being paid is only 344. So you can see that up front on this AM schedule, we're we're in it right now at a higher rate, which puts us in a great position to create a partial at a higher rate. So I could when we have the tool in here, you'll be able to see that uh, if you wanted to sell, let's say 180 payments, you can sell that 180 payments and the yield would be a lot higher than the full term because you're paying, you're, you're, um, you're giving them more interest in a shorter term. And what you're doing is you're taking that money in cash up front, which puts your yield higher as well and allows you to take that money and reinvest it and keep the back end of the loan. I don't want to get too much into the the workings of the uh, the, the partials, but I think that is a strategy that more and more people are using right now. And it's probably why a lot of these non-performing and performing loans are selling at a higher rate because they, especially the ones that are um, newer, you know, meaning one to two years out because there's, there's, there's great value in there. And, um, and people know that and they're, they're capitalizing on it. So I know that we're coming up to the tail end of our, our hour here. I don't wanna take up too much more of anyone's time. I hope that I was able to illustrate to you guys some of the tools that we have, how easy it is to navigate this and actually make your, your bids accordingly. Thank you guys for coming. Hope to see you next time. Hope to see you soon. And uh, yeah, you guys have a good week. Have a good weekend. See you guys.